Great. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paul Walton and Anna Reader and Chris Brunt for inviting me here. Um, I, the, you see the topic, okay, that I have going to focus on. This is the structure of what I'm going to talk about. I always think it's useful to know what the roadmap is. I'm first going to argue the change is possible because I think we can often persuade ourselves there's no point, okay? And I'm going to do that in the context of talking about the University of Limerick, a new university on the west coast of Ireland, best practice universities globally and also the national context. I'm then going to talk about the factors involved in creating change, particularly focusing on leadership and other internal and external factors. And I'm also going to recognize that gender and getting change is a tough task, okay, because gender is ubiquitous and often invisible. Then the third section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Higher Education Authority report, which Paul and I were two of the five people on, chaired by Maura Gagan Quinn. Some of you may know her. She was former, um, basically, uh, European Commissioner for Research. And that report was launched in 2016. And I suppose I think some of the people here may like to get ideas as to how they could push at national level. Okay, um, And then, very briefly, I'm going to say what is success. And I forgot to ask, will uh, you give me a sign at five minutes? Right, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so the first section I want to talk about is to argue, I've been told, by the way, to go between this spot and the desk, right? So that's why if I occasionally look down, I'm minding my place, okay? So change is possible. And at the University of Limerick, where I basically, I went to the University of Limerick as a lecturer in 1992. I've had a very long career. I started paid employment in 1970. I graduated at 19 with first class honours degree in a hurry, right? Um, so I had been 20, basically over 20 years in four or five organisations before I went to the University of Limerick. And in the University of Limerick at that time and up to 1997, there was no woman at full professoriate level. And I used to say, I never even noticed this till about 1994. You know the way some women, some of us, are not, you know, I've always found it very hard to argue for myself and very easy to argue for other people. But at a point, I thought to myself, I was coming up to 25 years in academia and I was one step up on the ladder. And I used to say, if I was a horse, you wouldn't back me. You know, the Irish system is similar to the British in that the lecturer, senior lecturer, associate prof, prof, right? I was in my 40s at this stage. So there was no woman at professoriate level, full professoriate level. Within 15 years, 34% of those at full professoriate level were women. Now, interestingly, at that time, there was still no woman at full professoriate level in the STEM area. There now is, right? So the proportion now is 13%. Now, in case you think this is all about how wonderful the University of Limerick is, it isn't really, because the proportion of women has been actually falling marginally, and we're waiting for the next load of figures. So, but definitely, change is possible, but a continuous effort is, is needed because permanency cannot be assumed, right? Things change, it's a fluctua fluctuating situation. So in the 2013 to 15 period, you know, when you look at figures, people say, ah, oh, yeah, well, that was a year we just had a lot of women retire, resign, you know, the usual excuses. So between 13 and 15, over three years, averaging in the University of Limerick, it was 31%, okay? The Irish national figure is 19%, okay? So change is possible. In one organisation, I have seen it. Right, okay. Um, and of course, in a way, people say, well, professors, who cares about those really? Well, I think it's important because often sitting on boards, making appointments, making decisions which affect all of your lives, often the people have to be at professoriate level. So if you can't get change there, then you stymie change further down. At national level, as Paul has said, the Higher Education Authority, you have your equivalent here. In the 90s, it was actually concerned with gender. And we have this illusion that things get better. Well, not always, right? Because in the 2000s, for example, 
it has a responsibility under Europe to return gender figures. Well, blow me, between 2004 and 12, it kept sending in the 2004 figures, right? It never collected or published them. I like figures because I think if you can't see the situation, you don't know whether you're improving or disimproving. So the fact that they weren't being published, there was no problem because there was no evidence. Well, hello. Things began to improve 2014-15. Right, and uh, I'll talk about why and how. And the expert group was set up. Paul, myself, chaired by Maura Gagan Quinn, Helen Peterson from Gothenburg, and uh, Ryan Shanks from Accenture. Its report came out in June 2016. In Irish terms, and I think also in terms of York, the recommendations are radical, systemic, as well as being evidence-based and implementable. I'll talk a little bit more about those. Now, implementation has started interestingly with the research organizations funding organizations but anyway so are there other examples maybe all this this is you know just one university in the world so i'm a member of the women in higher education network basically and in 11 countries women uh, in each country decided to choose an example that was a best practice in that country. Now, setting the bar, not too high, are you with me? But, and basically to write that up as a case study. And the promo is that book is coming out in about a month's time, Gendered Success in Higher Education Global Perspectives, edited by Kate White and myself. And now in some cases, for example, in the UK, Sarah Barnard chose to focus on Athena Swan for example. In some cases, the decision was made on the basis of percentage of women in senior management or professoriate positions. And you will see there, in seven of the 11 countries, when we look back, in seven of the 11 countries, roughly 40% of those in senior management were women. And look at the variety of countries. In eight of the 11, women made up roughly 30% of the full professoriate. Now, and in a way, what's important is the range of countries, like what has Sweden in common with India or the United Arab Emirates, are you with me? So the assumption that external context is all is challenged by this. Okay, the European Union average, by the way, is 21%. I forgot to say, if I can just back a second, when I was talking about the University of Limerick, the most common assumption is that women are the problem. Are you with me? And what was really helpful in the University of Limerick is that basically the fact that change had occurred over time, when women are presumably, our biology doesn't change in 15 years, are you with me? But also there was a university up the road, 100 kilometers, and where the proportion of women at full professoriate level there was 31%, up the road it was 13%. So again, the assumption that women are the problem was challenged by this. Women's biology doesn't change either, either in 15 years or 100 kilometers. So, and the, but the point I'm making, that's, uh, sorry about that, I just forgot to say that and it's a good example so I felt I should go back. But this is also challenging the assumption that it is the external environment that's key because obviously Sweden is a lot more facilitative of gender equality than most of the countries there. Okay, so that's the first section. Change is possible, and the assumption that women are the problem and women need to change is challenged by this picture, these pictures that I have been painting. So what makes the difference? What's the key factor? So in this second section, I want to argue first that leadership is key. Leadership defined as a process of influence in Gunter's terms. Whether it's leadership top down, bottom up, gender champions, or across. Now it's also leadership in a context. And that context is a particular organizational and national context. And there are elements of synergies and chance. Are you with me? <laughs> like, you know, they always say Napoleon was a lucky general, right? You know what I mean? That in a way there are intangibles which are difficult. So it's a multifactorial contextual explanation. Now, informal gender champions are a key element in this. And many of you who are here are those people. Are you with me? Because you wouldn't be here unless you were part of the movement in York. Okay, which, and I do know York's reputation, which is excellent in the area of gender equality. 
So the first strategy I thought it might be helpful, particularly talking in the UL context, what were the kinds of strategies that myself and other people used? Well, firstly, using opportunities. Prior to the Universities Act, being concerned with gender, you were a problem, do you know what I mean? A crank, a difficult person who just kept going on and on about these things. Blow me, when the Universities Act was passed, you, one became a solution because the people on top needed to devise policy, they needed to create structures, and they had no idea what to do. Are you with me? So suddenly, people like me, who'd been seen as a problem, became a solution. Okay. Perverse alignments. In the early 90s, in this uni un the university I was in, as in many universities, the basis on which promotions and recruitments happened was, you know, great potential. He's clearly a man with potential, right? A nice bloke, family responsibilities, needs the job. You know, all those, uh, well, to me, very loose, very subjective mm, assertions, right? And so, at a point, joined up with the 2000s with managerialist human resource people who were concerned, both of us had to share totally different perspectives, but had a common interest in quantifiable measures of, you know, why should this person get the job? Potential, you know, how do you assess potential other than in terms of what you have actually achieved? But this loose, you know, he will be great someday with no evidence. Hello. Right, so this was a perverse alignment. It's been called by Newman. Now, it had problems, okay. <laughs> the third one, legitimation. Being concerned with gender in academia is often seen as lacking legitimacy, you know. It's, uh, you know, so are we going to basically sacrifice excellence for this, you know, gender equality? So legitimation, legitimating a gender agenda was very important. And that was done through stakeholder, stakeholder involvement, particularly through getting research funding from prestigious organisations in Ireland. Science Foundation Ireland would be the most prestigious. And getting them to fund gender research. And of course, universities like research funding and they like prestigious research funding. And so if Science Foundation Ireland was willing to fund gender research, you know, there must be something to it, right? Um, so establishing legitimacy, managing management at an individual level. Paul will know that I think it's really important to understand people's guts, right, where they're coming from, okay? And way back in the 90s, the founder of the University of Limerick was a man called Ed Walsh, who was a visionary in all sorts of ways, but when I say he was not a feminist, it's an understatement of the gravest kind, right? He had no real understanding of gender. And he wouldn't be insulted if I said that because it's a fact, okay? So anyway, this was the man who was the president, your equivalent, vice chancellor. But he had a very strong feeling that he wanted his university to be a secular university. So pointing out to him in a governing authority, when I was invited as a speaker, that his university, as he saw it at the time, had no women at full professoriate level. And it shared this characteristic with the Pontifical University in Maynooth, a university for the training of priests, right? Culminated in an invitation within the week, right? To basically tell him what could be done within the law to improve the position of women in this university. That's what I mean by managing management, finding the button, okay, which is pressable. Talking to him about social justice, are you with me? Um, but this button. So, provocative misbehaviour, direct action. The university eventually, after 37 meetings, passed an equal opportunity policy, which said there should be, this the late 90s, representation, women's representation on boards. Now, that was a very unfortunate word, by the way, because it was subsequently construed as one woman and 12 men. What an insult to men, right? One woman equals 12 men, right? But anyway, um, basically, the policy was no sooner passed than it was breached, right? And a lot of men, my head of department, the dean, the vice president, academic and registrar, the director of HR, signed off on this all-male board. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I basically kicked up about it and then received an invitation to come to a meeting with all these men whom I had offended. Are you with me? 
by challenging their decisions and to bring a union representative with me. So obviously implying I was at this stage at professoriate level in my probationary year as a professor. This does underline the importance of being a member of a union, by the way. So that's provocative misbehaviour. And since then, I'll, I'll talk a tiny little bit about Micheline Sheehy Skeffington, very, uh, actually a granddaughter of a famous feminist, right? And um, Sheehy's and the Skeffingtons are notoriously stubborn families, going back to the 1916, whatever, our little rebellion. But anyway, and she uh, won a case against Galway. And I'll talk a little bit. And that is obviously direct action of the, at a more serious level. Mine was only a little skirmish. Mobilising ties across universities. We have always felt that, you know, it's really important to have ties with, so in Ireland there are only seven universities, and so we've had very active ties with most of those, particularly with Trinity College, which is the most prestigious, with UCC and with NUIG, uh, Galway, right? So, formal leadership, yes, some of you perhaps are or will be in positions as heads of department um, or further up the line. Um, Formal leadership is critical in terms of creating structures. At a point in the University of Limerick, there were two equality structures, one in the governing board and one in the university. There are none now. Formal leadership is really important. Culture, policies, even if you get the policies, if the culture doesn't change, as in the case of female representation, they can be subverted. Criteria, really important, but again, if you don't change the culture, criteria can be subverted again. There's a practice, for example, that I, it took me years to realise just, you know, you take things for granted. And there's a practice whereby, like, marking schemes were devised and you had to, before an ad went into the papers, you had to identify marking schemes. But the board meets on the morning and can change the criteria. And at that stage, they have seen the CVs obviously an opportunity for bias. And I never noticed it for years, are you with me? This shows you how you really want to all the time stay in focus. But criteria very important. Responding to external challenges, it just happened. UL, there was the only time ever the government basically made a call for a competition for uh, basically a community-based medical school. And the University of Limerick, which had no medical school, applied for it. Now, that was chance that the opportunity presented, and they were successful. The university was successful, and that had consequences because at that time, they, um, uh, in the, um, at that time, women were admitted to medical school simply on the basis of leaving search results. That has changed, right? Um, and so the state wanted to encourage the relationship between universities and uh, basically medicine was funding professorships. So this is how, you know, your own little action, the people who argued for the criteria of the admission to medical school being simply on the basis of what is called leaving search results, state results in Ireland, they indirectly helped you know, women to get into professorships in the University of Limerick. And these, this community-based medical school accounted for 9% of the 34% of the professorships. So there's several lessons to be drawn there. Responding to informal champions. Um, gender awareness training for executive actually happened in the 90s in Ireland, which was extraordinary. And it didn't happen again until basically 2014 when Paul did it. That in a way, sometimes, you know, you can be ahead of the posse and all sorts of things change and you fall behind. Making unusual appointments. For different reasons, the president, for example, a dean of teaching, a new post was made and a woman was appointed who was at lecturer level. Extraordinary. In a way, that changed the assumption that you needed to be a man to be in senior position. There were also, at a point in the 2000s, um, I was also the first woman to be appointed as dean. And then subsequently, basically, there were two women as of the uh, four deans uh, in a restructuring exercise. Publicly legitimating a gender agenda. This is very important for your top person, your vice chancellor, to be present, to publicly legitimate. And I suppose there is a difference. Like in UL, we never got beyond the, um, the presidents. Each of them, I mean, for various reasons, for, uh, there were four of them in a 15-year period, which is very unusual because the length in Ireland is 10 years, okay? But you can see it as a period of instability. But they usually opened and closed. 
Whereas in, for example, Sweden and in another university in Ireland, the Maynooth, I was there a fortnight ago, and the president stayed for the entire session. Obviously, you get greater commitment. Then the he is hearing the arguments. Are you with me? Um, initiating specific programs such as Athena Swan. Formal leadership is really important. I was dean for 10 years. And I wish I wouldn't have done it, only I enjoyed it and I was effective. Um, but like I think women get really put off and you don't realize that there are, it was far easier than being course director in women's studies because it had all these supports. I had two assistant deans, I had a secretary, I had a faculty manager, I had heads of department, Lord above, you know. If you couldn't do it under those circumstances. Whereas as course director in women's studies, on your own, are you with me? Mostly with part-timers around you who you could not reasonably expect to go out on a limb. So don't be put off by formal power positions and think, oh my God, I'd never manage that. Much easier. A credible external experts. Now this is where to legitimate a focus on gender, you do need, as my father, God be good to him, used to say, the man from out of town. Are you with me? <laughs> Uh, basically, and to facilitate the credibility of the exercise, also to help move forward, focus on gender action plans, etc. Paul was that man in the University of Limerick. So he was invited by the president to address the executive committee, which would be very unusual and was mega effective. Also by the dean of science and engineering to address future leaders, mega effective. And Paul is an absolutely, he'd sell Ice to the Eskimos, are you with me? But also the fact that he was coming from York, are you with me? Very credible, very prestigious university and very credible in terms of Athena Swan. So in a way, no matter how good the internal people are, recognize the expert is the man from out of town. Of course, I'm breaching all of that now, but anyway, I'm the woman from out of town, but there you go. Um, so the importance of other factors in, in the University of Limerick. Well, it is, UL had always prided itself on being an innovative pioneering institution that was part of its vision of itself. It was also a new university, so there were, quite honestly, more seats on the bus at professoriate level. The number of seats, professorial positions, increased 2.7 in the University of Limerick in comparison to 1.6 in the overall university system. There was a tradition of women's and gender studies going back to the 1980s, funded by Europe, an enterprising woman, Evelyn Mahan, way before I ever got there, had got funding from Europe for skills development for people to do courses in women's studies. Lateral thinking, right? Um, chance, never underestimate chance. Sometimes, you know, you can, things just don't fall in. But I always believe, you know, it's the lighting the candle metaphor, but sometimes you get a fire much handier by chance, okay? Um, and I've talked about that. But it's important to recognize the change in the University of Limerick, although the professoriate, like from zero to 34% over a 15 year period is phenomenal, but it was limited and not permanent. So other things, for example, women in governing authority, the proportion of women did not change. I suppose, I mean, I do think that the professoriate is important, but you have to kind of decide. You can't do everything all at once. The other best practice cases, these are the WEM, Women in Higher Education Management, the book we've coming, where we, across 11 countries, we chose best practice in each of these countries, some angle on it. What was important? looking at those. External legislative and policy context, yes, important, and certainly the best examples, and in fact, were from universities from Sweden and Austria, and those are the most facilitative external context. But internal factors were also very important. And even in the best practice are atypical in Sweden and Austria, if you're with me. So what were the internal factors? Historical, size, ethos, the concern with gender, a tradition of. You have that now. You know what I mean? The question is, can you capitalize on it? Linking it to the academic, the core business of the university, teaching and research. So it's not simply seen as this is just HR's issue. Are you with me? Leadership, absolutely critical. Formal and informal, up, down, across. Structures and culture related to gender. 
I just was learning from Maria that her office is reporting, is outside HR. I think that's really important because HR is becoming more and more corporatist and one way and another, no matter what the people in it want, they become apologists for the university. And in the case of gender, you often need to just say, this is a problem. What are we going to do about it? The centrality of gender, I talked about that. Specific initiatives, yes. Athena Swan is flavour of the month at the present moment, flavour of the year. And yes, I think it is useful. But for example, Sarah Barnard has looked at goal departments. And what is striking is that even goal departments tend to focus mostly on early career. And even when they target mid and senior levels, they focus mainly on training and encouraging women. The implicit message being that women are the problem. We have to be sorted. We lack confidence. We lack political skills. We lack X, Y, and Z, and the problem of lifestyle choices. Are you with me? OK. But here, York is really very, 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 very important that York's focus on analysing and publishing gender pay gap is unusual and very commendable that you are tackling difficult stuff, are you with me? And I think that's not unrelated to the issue of leadership, which I see here, whereas Athena Swan can become a box ticking exercise, completely rhetorical, you know? Um, and also uh, the percentage of SLs who are women increased in chemistry in York, very substantially, 12% to 33% over seven years. This is making an actual difference, do you know what I mean? Not just saying, you know, going through the motions. What is sobering, clearly Athena Swan has brought a focus on gender, and that's good. What is either sobering if you're in set, but good if you're in non-set, is that I know Athena Swan has recently been extended outside set, but if you take 2014 as a cutoff, and this was it was in set at that stage, the proportion of women at, professor, at professorial level in non-set increased far more than the percentage of women in set. Now, one thing you can draw from this is that in many cases, Athena Swan lacks leadership and it has become rhetorical and it's not making a difference. And another lesson to be learned is that even if you're not in set, there, are, there is clearly you know, a payoff from being bold, are you with me? Stroppy, focusing on this issue. In Ireland, at national level, our higher education authority, I said, totally asleep for eight years, not even returning the figures. External pressure, the EU and the OECD. The OECD in 2012 published a report called Closing the Equality Gap Act Now! Exclamation mark. You find allies in very surprising places. Me, I'm not too fussy as long as they're, and it's an excellent report. The EU has been talking about the importance of diversity in increasing research innovation. You know, talking to yourself, if you've got, people are all the same, there's no new ideas. Cooperation at national level, I think it's so important. So three EU funded projects in Ireland, three different universities, Genovate in UCC, Integer in Trinity, Feste in UL. Basically, we work together. Michelin Sheehy Skeffington case, this 2008 case, which was eventually adjudicated on Equality Tribunal, this in Galway University, 100 kilometers up the road. And I mean, it was fought by the university for six years. And yet, for example, a man was, it was promotion um, at senior lecturer level to senior lecturer. A man was promoted who didn't meet the basic criteria, which was having a PhD. And the university still defended that. They had a sheet at the end to tick if you had caring responsibilities. The Equality Tribunal concluded that in the culture there, to tick that was the kiss of death. Are you with me? Um, she was awarded, seven, by the time it came to the decision, she had re retired, resigned, given up. Well, not given up, but got totally sick of it, right? But she was awarded 70,000, which she has given to the five women who were shortlisted but not appointed with her in the 2008 competition. And basically, they're going to the High Court on it. 
But what is extraordinary is how the universe, the, the, you need to only to Google, it's a very unusual name, right? And you'll see the judgment, okay? You can't take a class action in Ireland. So, but the judgment makes it clear that the attitudes were such that it wasn't just Michelin, Sheehy, Skeffington that they had a problem with, do you know? But the fact that the university could defend it when they had promoted a man who had, like either you have a PhD or you haven't, are you with me? You can argue about the quality of publications, but, and they still promoted him. So this was, this caused a huge fuss. And of course, her spectacular act in handing over the 70,000, you can imagine, very unusual, got a lot of coverage. And NUIG, the Galway, the president in Galway, didn't want Galway to be seen as an outlier. So what he had to do was persuade the Higher Education Authority that this was a common problem, not just Galway, right? And the CEO, the chief executive officer of the HEA was coming up to retirement and thought, what have I to lose, right? So he set up the review. Um, and you see there who was on it. So the problem I'm saying, yes, gender works at an individual level, yes. And we all experience that. And we're not from outer Mongolia. We're all from our own societies. And so our attitudes, and we talked, uh, talking to Maria about the imposter syndrome when I was promoted and became a professor, my first thought, which I had wanted since I was 15, although I had kind of digressed on the way, and I was in my late 40s, and I had publications, and I had PhD, and I had done all the paperwork, but my first thought was, the shoes are too big, you know. Now, when I became a dean, I thought the shoes are very small, right? Um, but the whole idea of being a professor, you know what I mean? I just, I mean, if you Google professor, it's very interesting, you'll only find white men. And the feeling that, you know, I didn't fit, I was a fraud. Um, so it works yet at an individual level, but it also works at other levels. The interactional organization is systemic, and I'm going to say a tiny word about each of these. It is reflected in processes that we take for granted. Inbreeding, fishing, you know, we want somebody who fits in this culture, one of our own, you know. It's been called inbreeding, Cooper and Elston, um, Lynch et al. Nepotism. In Sweden, Veneris and Vold identified that nepotism in research funding in Sweden was an issue in 1997. And the Swedish Research Council has remained so concerned about it that in 2014 they put observers in on boards to see what was going on, are you with me? And they found, for example, doubt raisers being raised much more often about women. Application comes in, woman is from a very good research institute. The question is, is it her own work or is she piggybacking on the work of the institute? CV comes in from a man from a good research institute. Clearly he's brilliant, are you with me? He's coming from a good research institute. Doubt raisers, been written up by Alquist et al. So nepotism, Venus and Vold also identified Sexism, I'll talk a bit more about that. Gendered cognitive bias, basically double standards being applied to women, right? The same CV, I'll talk about Mastrakusen. Cognitive bias, homosociability, appointing people like yourself, and gender being a key marker. Of course, it also applies to race, etc. But if you see here is a young man coming up, I, I was that young man 20, 30 years ago. Who's going obvious choice to be appointed? Somebody like me. Um, and these are references to basically the studies that politically expedient gender blindness study I was involved in where they had basically a research applications assessed by gender balanced teams, but then they put and they identified rank them one, you know, excellent to poor. And then they put that aside and actually made politically expedient decision who was paying the money. They had to get something back. So these are just a flash of naming some processes because I often think if you can name it, you, it immediately loses it, its power. But to go at it another level, to say gender exists at an interactional level. I did a study on management and gender and higher education in Ireland, looking at the top three levels. President, Vice Chancellor, Vice President, Vice Chancellor, and Dean Division Director. And in this, in Ireland, roughly four fifths of those in senior management are men, right? And the senior management women, who were a minority, saw their male colleagues. Now, these were obviously very competent, right? Effective women, since they had managed to get up the greasy pole. And they saw their male colleagues' perception of them as look at the adjectives disruptive confrontational, dissenting, 
frightening, intimidating, out of place. Too questioning, quote, too challenging, asking uncomfortable questions. This has, these words have resonances of Cantor's 1977 Ard Maiden's archetype. But the fact that they're floating around, is this just Ireland? No. Similar words used by, in Huso has referred to them, in Finland and Montes Lopez in Spain. Senior management is a male area. Women are out of place there. Women, these women, these senior management women felt themselves to be. Of course, you could say, well, obviously these women were, you know, they had chips on their shoulders. They saw everybody seeing them critically. No, their female colleagues, they saw their female colleagues' perception of them as supportive, trailblazers, role models. The point I'm making here is that the water cooler conversations and perceptions is a reality and it can make women feel very uncomfortable, unwelcome. Could that be why women don't go for senior positions? Oh Lord above. Gender at the organisational level. This is basically not always open competition, drawing on both Netherlands and Denmark, where it's in, Den in Netherlands, for example, it's meant to be open competition, and yet uh, Van den Brink found that in two thirds of the cases, it was not. Nielsen, Matthias Nielsen, has also shown an awful lot of competitions, only one person. The whole business of the actual words used in ads, strong leadership versus collaborative. Um, there are more chairs in male-dominated areas in Ireland because male-dominated areas are seen as more likely to be in the national interest. And women often have less opportunity for profiling, higher teaching and pastoral work. This um, basically double standards. It's an experimental study by Mastrokusen in the US. Same CV to male and female names and both the men and the women in this research intensive university favoured the male CV and thought he should be appointed at a higher level. Um, Venus and Vold found that women had to have two and a half times more scientific publications in order to be assessed as, as scientifically competent and that was in Spain. So it's been called patriarchal dividend, negative symbolic coefficient, misrecognition. I'll talk about the orchestra example. The whole, what we mean by excellence, can we ever really get it out? The HEA expert report, I'm going to vaguely wave at. Changing the relationship between excellence and gender. Evidence-based, peer-reviewed literature, consultations. Uh, also, a online survey completed by roughly 5,000, or roughly one in five of the staff. Um, and starting from the position that the problem is organisation. And so some of its recommendations to define gender as a national priority. Um, because then that gets reflected in the compacts made with the individual higher education institutions. Also to link it to Athena Swan, and that has already been done by the um, uh, research institutions. So it links, it actually says if universities don't pay attention to the gender profile of their senior positions and also their most key committees, not every committee, every 5 8 committee, just those dealing with resources, either human or money, um, and these, the most senior executive and also the Athena Swan Awards, then they basically lose resources. Now what is particularly important to say is that there was a difference in the proportion Mostly four-fifths of those in senior management and in the professoriate in Ireland are men. But men were much less likely to think there was gender inequality. So obviously a key task is to help men to see this. 68% of the women, but only 64% of the women, 38% of the men thought there was gender inequality. And obviously if you don't think it exists, you're not going to feel the need to take any kind of positive action. So yes, it is radical. It's saying that demonstrable experience of leadership in advancing gender equality should be a key criterion. That would increase interest, do you know what I mean, in gender equality for heads of department, deans and uh, vice chancellors. Um, having a vice president for equality, having gender champions and also mandatory quotas. The flexible cascade model, the proportion being similar to that at a lower level, and recognising the importance of professor level, and the fact that change has happened in the University of Limerick, but it has not happened other places. It started, now UL is going backwards, they're going forward, but 
the 40 percent of those at full prof level to be women by 2024. The range currently is 13 percent to 31 percent. If it was women's bodies, are you with me, you wouldn't get that range. It's again unstable, interesting times, unstable context because there's a new CEO coming in. Leadership at the top is really important. The, basically, the universities themselves are slow at the moment, but there is quiet progress being made at the HEA, but it remains to be seen, will the new CEO and the HEA and the new chair run with this or what will happen? Main funding agencies, three big funding agencies have all supported that basically institutions have to have within three years a bronze, within seven years a silver institution award in order to compete for funding. That put the frighteners on some people, right? So what is success? The very last thing I'm going to say, what is success? The European research area has defined it pragmatically. Basically, gender equal representation in all hierarchical positions and in all fields, abolishing cultural and structural barriers, and also integrating gender into the core business of the organization, teaching and research. In UL, we focused on one small indicator, percentage of women at full profit level. In the best of the two examples of best practice are Austria and Sweden in the forthcoming book. In uh, Roblovsky's Austrian example, it's a small arts university led by feminist, okay, with the top, the top management is all women and feminist, right? And it's integrated into the actual. In Peterson's example, it's uh, much more, less, much more, uh, I was going, you know, um, normal in commas university, right, in the sense that it is uh, spread across disciplines. But they saw the uh, and shared space as basically trying to break down the basis for male power, space and discipline being seen as two of the key bases for male power. So these are some of the indicators that I think, yes, gender balance and senior management and profit, symbolically important and practically important, but not enough. I'm coming to the conclusion feminist leadership is critical. Actually lead, integrating it into the core business and increased intersectionality will come from this, are you with me? Um, as well as less binary choices. So what have I been saying? At 90 miles an hour, but anyway, that success is possible. We know actually that 70% of change initiatives fail, but I have seen in my time, right, that for example in the KCUL, the proportion of women at full professoriate level going from zero to 34% over 15 years, it is possible. And there was no special funding or action projects or anything else, are you with me? But it was simply leadership at all levels. And that example, you see, you can never know your knock-on effects. That example facilitated the national quota at the higher education level because we could say, well, UL can do it, right? And UL is now beginning to fall back and other universities are beginning to increase. So clearly it is doable, but there is some kind of a pullback. It is frustratingly glacially slow, right? In the other best practice examples, we are moving to a world where it will be seen as normal, in fact, commas for 40% of senior management and 30% of profits to be women. That's actually happening globally. Multifactorial leadership is key, absolutely key. Change is possible, but it's neither permanent nor total. Thank you very much. <laughs>